may be seated. Good evening. Um, today I'm going to be sharing a song with you uh, titled Speak, O Lord, as we begin the uh, series. Uh, this is a very powerful song on how we ask the Lord to speak to us at, uh, as we listen to his words that he gives us. you 
Amen. Thank you so much for that wonderful song. Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for coming to study the word with us. I'm Pastor Ryan Johnson, and my dear friend, Pastor Thomas Clark, is he in the building? Uh, there he is there. The two of us will be studying with you over the next few days, and we are honored that we can study together. I am a believer in the fact that every time we open the Word of God to read, that the Spirit is present to guide us, to reveal things to us, because it is God's will that we understand His Word. I can go back. That's all right. I'll just pause right there. Before we get into it, I want to tell the story of a friend of mine who's actually a member of the church here. He was telling me how he met Jesus. And his story goes a bit like this. His wife was a fervent follower of Christ. And he didn't want anything to do with that Jesus. And she was always pestering him. Oh, why don't you come to church with me? Oh, why don't you read your Bible with me? Oh, let's study together. And he said, no, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. And one day, his wife, as she always did, got up and went to church. It was the weekend. And he was in bed by himself because he didn't want anything to do with that Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? And his wife was gone, and he thought, yes, she's gone. No more nagging. Now I can do all the things I want to do. I can watch all the things I want to watch. I can say the stuff I want to say. And so he gets out of bed, and he goes into the front room. The front room is kind of like the living room. That's what we call it in the South, the front room. And he goes in there, and he sees there on a chair, his wife has left her Bible. And it's just sitting there. And I want you to understand something. There was no preacher in the house. <laughs> there was no teacher in the house. Nothing but my friend, the Word, and the Lord. And he walked over to that Bible and he said, I'm going to open that thing up and I'm going to find something that I can use to ridicule my wife when she gets back. I'm going to know something when she gets back. I'm going to roll my neck like this when she gets back. Not knowing that the Spirit, have mercy, was already at work in his life. He reached down and he picked up the word and he opened it to read. And read. And read. Have mercy. By the time my friend's wife got home, Jesus had done his thing. There is power, life-changing power in the Word of God. I have seen it. You have seen it. And with something so wonderful as God's Word, it behooves us, doesn't it, to study it. Everything we teach, everything we preach must come from the Word of God. If it is not based in the Word of God, we have nothing to do with it. If it is not based in the Word of God, there is no light. The Word is powerful. The Word is truth. Before we sing and pray, I have this little song I love to sing every time I get up. It's kind of my own testimony. But before we do, I would just like to prime you, if I may, with what you see here on the screen. This is not a religious website. That's why we have the source there. I urge you, in fact, because time is of the essence, I will put text on the screen. Go ahead and get a pen or pencil or something. Use an electronic device, your holy iPad or your holy iPhone, and put the texts in there. See for yourself. This is a site called Local Histories, and it just tells the histories of things. And I just want you, just to prime you, just to look at the history of the world, if we may. There at 539, Babylon, 
which was an empire, is captured by the Persians. 525, those same Persians taken over the world, they conquer Egypt. And then look at 490, the Greeks defeat the Persians. And if you go on down here, Alexander the Great, he was a Greek. Everyone knows Alexander the Great was a Greek. He controls all of the former Persian Empire. So first we had the Babylonians, then we had the Persians there, and now we have the Greeks. This is history. Okay, friends, I'm having some issues with this. Can I have the next slide, please? Alexander dies. And then we look down here. This is just history. 202 B.C., the Romans defeat the Carthaginians. And look down here. <laughs> Rome is at its peak. This is history. It's not religious. It's just history. This is what has happened. There was Babylon, and then there was the Persian Empire. That's Iran and Iraq. That's what's left of that. Then along came the Greeks, and then the Romans took over. We have all those planets in the sky with those strange Greek and Roman names. That's history. I wonder if God is in control of history. I wonder what the Word of God has to say about our history. And that is what it is that we are going to examine. Next slide, please. In tonight's message that is titled, The Truth of God's Word. If there is no truth, why would we study it? But there's truth in God's Word. Couldn't decide whether to call it the truth of God's Word or the power of God's Word. But I decided there's power in truth. So the truth of God's word. You have to excuse me, I'm overcoming a little illness. So if you know this song, please sing with me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, sanctuary, Lord for you, Lord for you. In the Bible, God said, and let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So we sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Please come and dwell in us. And this is the patience of the saints, it says in Revelation. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior in heaven. Lord, we need a miracle tonight. Because the bald-headed preacher is held together by duct tape. <laughs> But he has seen that you can do miracles, Lord. Send your spirit tonight and work a miracle as we dig into your word and see for ourselves that your word is true. And determine for ourselves that if your word is true, then we ought to do everything your word says. If your word says go left, then we should go left, Lord. If your word says go right, then we ought to do that. And of course, when you come in your clouds of glory, let no one that is in this building, no one that is watching online be missing. Let us all be present, we pray. In thy name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's do an overview of the Bible. What is this thing? Mine's looking a little tore up. I just finished doing a crusade in the middle of a monsoon. I finished the crusade, and I looked down, and a bullfrog had hopped up to the, to the preacher spot. Hey, everybody needs Jesus, amen? <laughs> but the rain came down, and the floods came up, and look at the condition of my Bible. But that's all right. Contained in here is the word. What is between these leather leaflets? What is it that we have on our phones? The Bible consists of 66 individual books. Some have been written by the same author, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then there are other authors as well. Psalms was written by King David, for example. There are two main sections in the Bible. There is the Old Testament, and we all know that. 
The Old Testament talks about the history of God's people, the Israelites, and then there's a little gap there. And then there's the New Testament, which begins, as you can see here, with a discussion of Christ's life in four books called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And if you read carefully, you can see the personalities of each of the authors as they discuss Christ's life. This is what I like. Paul says that anybody that is redeemed under the blood of Jesus Christ is considered his people. So the Bible is not just a history of God's people, the Israelites. It is our history as God's people. That's what it is. Also in the Bible, there are predictions about the future. We call them prophecies. Anybody can make a prediction, but only the Bible can make a true prophecy. Amen? Amen. And then I put this one here on the bottom. There are promises in the Bible because it says that God, not being an ordinary man, <laughs> not being a woman, he is not like us. He does not lie. And because God cannot lie, that means if he makes a promise, he keeps it. Now, maybe you would like to live a mediocre Christian existence. Well, that's your decision. But if you want to see some real power, you will open your Bible and find some of the promises that God has made to us. And when you pray, you will say, Lord, I want to do your will. Lord, I want to keep your commandments. And Lord, you promised in your word. That's called claiming a promise. Yeah, go ahead and pray like that. And be amazed at what God will do for you. But if you're too scared, I understand, you know, that mediocrity. But if you want to see God move in your life, claim some promises from his word and see what takes place. Oh, uh, we could preach a whole sermon on that. What does Jesus say about the Bible? Jesus himself says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So because Jesus said so. And that's the highest authority right there. The Bible is true. What else does it say? Oh, man, I promise, okay. So, oh, we skipped over. There we are. It says in 2 Timothy, talking about where the Bible came from, it says all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. You can get doctrine from the Bible. You'll be all right. For reproof and for correction, you can be corrected by the Word of God. You will be all right. It says it's for instruction in righteousness. You can be led to righteousness following the Word of God, and you'll be all right by God's grace. It says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What this is saying is that the scripture was inspired by God. God himself. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that the very creator of the entire universe has spoken and we have access to the same power that was manifest when he said, let there be light. Same power right here. It's the words of God. So let's move on. The Bible is true. That's what Jesus said. The Bible is the very inspired word of God. And that is why everything that is in the word we can do is good for us. It's good for us physically. It is good for our salvation and everything in the word of God we should do. Because we will not be well physically, and we will not be saved if we do not follow the instruction. It's a crazy world out there. Thankfully, the Lord has left instructions here in his word. And I thought what we would do is we would look at one of the awesomest examples of the power of God's word right here in this building tonight. I love this example. Jesus says... When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. Let's just stop right there. Jesus was looking at the temple, coming toward the close of his earthly ministry. And he had spoken things about his, his coming, things about destruction that would come. And the disciples said, Jesus, 
When is all this going to happen? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And Jesus looked into the prophetic distance and he began to speak. You can find this wonderful sermon by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. But right here in verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. And then he talks about some other stuff. But look at this little thing right here that Jesus says. Whoso readeth Daniel, let him or her understand. Jesus said when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to understanding, when it comes to appreciating the power of the word of God, you ought to check out that prophet Daniel in a little book that he wrote named Daniel. So if Jesus said do it, I think we should do it. So let us look at the book of Daniel, which is found right toward the middle of the Bible, and let us see what things we can find that verify that God's word is indeed true. So we're going to the book of Daniel, and I have these scriptures written on the screen. You're welcome to turn. I think there is something therapeutic in turning in the pages of the Bible. But if it's too fast, go ahead and write it down and you can examine it for yourself later. We go to the book of Daniel and just to set the scene here in the book of Daniel, Daniel is located in the Old Testament. Just to set the scene, let's look at Daniel chapter 1 and the very first verse of the book of Daniel. Daniel opens up by talking about a tragedy that came upon God's people, the Israelites. And it says, and I'm going to be reading a lot of Bible here. I have to, so that you can see that what we are teaching comes right from the Word. It says, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Judah is where God's people lived. And the king at the time was Jehoiakim. Came another king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, into Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar besieged it. And the king spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. That he would bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. And now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel tells us how he wound up writing the book of Daniel. According to the word of God, while there was a king there in Judah with God's people minding their business and doing their thing, another king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar came in and messed everything up. You may have heard the story of the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a, he was a bit of a pyromaniac. He liked to burn things. Understand that when he went there into Judah, he burned everything, burned the temple, destroyed everything. But he didn't stop there. He then took young men of royal lineage and he kidnapped them, took them away from their home and took them back to his home, which was in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar came and kidnapped these young men, God's people. And among the people that were kidnapped, there was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And that is how Daniel wound up in Babylon. He was kidnapped, taken away from his home by the big bad king, Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel chapter 1 talks about some interesting things that we're going to talk about uh, on another day. But let's go right into Daniel chapter 2. So King Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel and took his friends and he said, I'm going to make you wise men. Now wise men meant that they were taught in magic and sorcery and astrology and all of these things that the people who did not know God thought brought them power. They thought they could get wisdom by looking at the layout of the stars. You know what? There are people today that think that. 
By seeing where Jupiter is in the sky, they can divine things. When all things divine come from the Most High. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. So we get to Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel tells a story. And here it is. It says, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, this is the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. You ever have a dream so disturbing it woke you up? You ever have a dream so bad you had to tell somebody? And remember, these are people that believed that dreams and stars and these sorts of things were significant. It says in verse 2, Then King Nebuchadnezzar commanded, and called the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. Notice there were no preachers in there. Mm -hmm. But brought all those magicians in for to show the king his dream. So all those magicians and sorcerers and all those guys, they came and they stood before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king answered and said to them, the thing is gone from me. I can't remember my dream, Nebuchadnezzar says. If you will not make known to me the dream with the interpretation, you shall be cut in little pieces. Well, I think that's pretty bad right there. But Nebuchadnezzar was thorough. And your houses shall be made a dunghill. That's messed up. So he says, I had a dream, and I can't remember what the dream was. You got to tell me what I forgot, and then tell me what the meaning was. And that was a pretty good plan, except, you know, cutting in the pieces. That's messed up. Because he realized that if he told the dream first, he couldn't remember it. But if he could and he told it first, they could just make something up. Oh, well, king, then the water represents your mother. And uh, no, 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 no. He said, I'll know when you tell me what I forgot. Then I know that the interpretation you tell will be true. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. But he forgot the dream. And this is what the magicians and all of them said. They said to the king, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, no lord, no ruler that asks such things of any magician. You can't ask us to tell you the meaning of your dream and you forgot it. I tell you what. Those non-believers didn't even realize they were, <laughs> they were preaching to the king when they accidentally said, there's no man on earth, no woman on earth that can reveal secrets. They were absolutely right. Verse 11, and it is a rare thing that King Nebuchadnezzar requires, and there's none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. We can't tell you what you are asking us, king. you got to be a god in order to do that. They were right, weren't they? <laughs> and look at verse 12. Remember, the king was messed up. This is a pyromaniac. He said, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious. My boss is Pastor Neary. I don't know where he is. I know how I feel when I think I've made him mad. I go into the office, and, hey, pastor, am I in trouble? And he sits there, waits a minute. No, you're not in trouble. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Imagine how they felt before the king, and the king was angry. There was no due process. If the king said, you're out of here, you are out of here. And that's what happened. The king was furious and commanded to destroy all of the wise men and all the magicians in Babylon. And you got to remember that Daniel and his three friends, they were in training to be wise men. They're doing their best. They're studying their books. Oh, they would never forget the God of heaven. But God had put them there for a reason. Hey, you never know why God has put you somewhere. Sometimes you may be on your job, and I know there are many here that have experienced this. And the way that they are acting at your job is not the way you know God would have you act. You cannot forget the Most High. You should never know who can be saved because of your witness. Daniel and his three friends were there in the midst of Babylon. These people who worshipped cows and the sun and the moon and magicians and astrologers, and they did not forget God but there they are 
forced to learn this magic and this astrology and stuff. And what happens? There's a knock on the door. And they open the door, and there's the captain of the king's guard. It says, hey, Daniel, good to see you. Oh, no, I'm good. Hey, we want to come in, have some lemonade? No, no, I'm okay. I just wanted to let you know that, um, yeah, the king's going to cut you into little pieces tomorrow. So, yeah, it's nice knowing you. <laughs> and, and Daniel said, why, right there, verse 15, is the decree so hasty from the king? What's his rush? Well, I tell you, because something was on the king's heart. When you are stressed, you'll do some stressful stuff. What is the rush from the king? And then Ariok told them what had happened. Verse 16, and Daniel went in and asked the king, said, please give us some time. And we will show the king the interpretation. And then Daniel went to his house, and I want you to note this. Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to his three praying buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and his companions, that they would, look at this, look at this, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret. What does it mean to desire mercies of the God of heaven? What does that mean? What does that mean? If you go home right now and desire mercies of the God of heaven as hard as you can, what are you probably doing? You are praying. Let this be a lesson to me. Let this be a lesson to you. Let this be a lesson to us all. Do not take one step forward, backward, to the right or to the left before you seek the Lord in prayer. Why would we do such a thing? Because it says right there, concerning the secret. Because God got the answers that we can't see. And why waste time with something or someone that doesn't have the answers? And so this is what happens. Daniel and his three praying buddies get together and they pray to the Lord. And you can read there in Daniel chapter 2 in those verses that Daniel went to sleep and God gave Daniel the exact same dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king had. And then he went a step further. He told Daniel the meaning of the dream. Because when God blesses you, he blesses you all the way. <laughs> None of these 50% blessings. That's not my God. And Daniel got up, and hastily he goes to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, I have it. Let's just hit the pause button on this chopping a little pieces part, just, just at least slow-mo. I have it. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and did thus unto them, and said thus unto them, I found a man of the captives of Judah, one of God's people, Jehovah's people, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. And the king answered and said to Daniel, whom had, they had changed his name to Belshazzar. Daniel was the name his mama gave him. Belshazzar was the name the king gave him when he got to Babylon. He says, are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation? And Daniel did not say, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I got this king. No, lest the king ask him something else and Daniel not have the answer. You better remember where your help comes from. Daniel said, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And I want to pause there because we are going to be looking into the word of God over the next few days. And I want you to know, many will tell you falsely that the Bible is meant to confuse you. God does not intend for you to understand. It's supposed to make it topsy-turvy so that you throw your hands up in despair. That is not what the word says. The Word says there's a God that revealeth secrets. If you're reading your Word and you don't get it, why don't you ask the one who wrote it? It is, his, it is his intention that we know. It is his intention that we understand. And he said this to Nebuchadnezzar. And here's the dream. Here's the dream that almost got everybody cut and diced. Can you all read that? Okay. It's a little for me. Thou, O king, sawest, says Daniel, telling the king his own dream. And behold, a great image. 
Another word for image is a statue. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, king, and the form thereof was terrible. And now listen to the details. Listen to the details. This image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms were of silver. His belly and his thighs were made of brass. What an interesting statue. Head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of brass. Then it goes on, verse 33. His legs were of iron, okay, and his feet were partly iron and partly clay mixed together. Head of gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay mixed. And I imagine that as he's talking, the king is going, yeah, 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 that's it. And now that God had displayed his power, mm -hmm, the king was tenderized and was ready to hear the truth. See, the power and the truth in the word of God. Yeah. But the dream didn't stop there. Verse 34, thou sawest till that a stone, a rock, a boulder was cut out without hands. A boulder cut itself out of the mountainside, flew through the air, and smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and broke it all into pieces. Interesting. And then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the shaft, the dust, the husks after people have rolled grain on the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried all the pieces away that no place was found for that gold and silver and brass and iron. But the stone that smote the image, the stone that cut itself out by itself, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw a statue, the head of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the belly and thighs were of brass or bronze, the legs were of iron, and the feet were a mixture of iron and clay. What could it mean? But while he was watching, a stone cut itself out, flew through time and space, hit the statue at the feet, broke it all into pieces. The statue was blown away, but the rock grew to the size of a mountain and filled the entire earth. And Nebuchadnezzar said, yes, yes, Belshazzar. And I imagined Belshazzar said, my mama called me Daniel, but we'll let it go. Yes, Belshazzar, I've seen the power in the word. Now I'm ready for the truth. That's how it is with us. We see the power in the word, and then we're ready for the truth. Jesus, in his ministry on earth, healed people, power in the word, and then the truth, go and sin no more. Really, Ryan? <laughs> this is the dream, Daniel said, and we will tell the king the interpretation thereof, and then the interpretation of the dream comes. Very simple, very elegant, very plain, very clear. Thou, O king, this is Daniel talking to Nebuchadnezzar, you are a king of kings. And I bet Nebuchadnezzar said, well, I mean, you know, I'm all right, but okay, I'll take it. King of kings, that's me. <laughs> he said, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. He's given you power and strength and glory and wheresoever the children of men dwell because he was a ruler over the entire realm. Babylon was the empire over the entire realm. So anybody's children, whoever they were, the beasts of the fields, the fowls of the heaven, he has given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Now listen, interpretation here it is, here it is, as we say back home, here it go, here it go, here it is. Thou art this head of gold. Now don't get caught up on the whole king. It says, he's given thee a kingdom. You, Nebuchadnezzar, 
representative of your kingdom. You are the head of gold. That's you. It is you. You are it. Got it? King said, yes, I'm tracking. And then he moves on. And this had to be a hard thing to tell a king, especially when you walk up in the court and the first thing you say is, oh, king, live forever. Daniel had to tell the truth, but he was ready because he'd seen the power. And after thee have mercy shall rise another kingdom. You first and then another one is coming, which is inferior to thee. And another kingdom will come. And that one represented by the brass, which shall bear rule over all the realm. The head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom. Then another kingdom would come, which was the silver. And another kingdom, a third kingdom would come, represented in the word of God as clear by the brass. And then what? Then a fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all of these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whatever it is this kingdom, whoever it is this kingdom represents, sounds like they're a rough bunch. And then it says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes partly of clay and partly of iron, the kingdom would then be divided. But there shall be in it the strength of iron, some will be strong, and also some hints of the kingdom that came before. For as much as thou sawest iron mixed with clay, with miry clay, because some would be weak like clay. Oh, we're getting there. The word of God is clear. Verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so shall the kingdom be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou saw iron mixed with miry clay, those kingdoms shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And when they say that, they talk about the world. A progressive drawing away from God himself. But they shall not cleave one to another. They will not mix. These kingdoms will not get along. Even as iron doesn't mix with clay. That's pretty plain. Especially from a God that supposedly is trying to confuse us. That's pretty plain. And in the days of these kings, because remember, that wasn't the end of the dream, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but God's kingdom will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever he breaks it down further for as much as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands because the kingdom of God is not created by any human being oh no cut out without hands, and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what will come to pass. And when you put it that way, what shall come to pass, and you realize God has just given a timeline of what is going to happen. And it says the dream is certain. Don't question it. And the interpretation thereof is sure. Don't question the word of God. So we got this statue with a head of gold, silver, bronze, iron legs, and then this iron mixed with clay. And the Bible says that each part represents a kingdom that will come, starting with King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So right there, before any of this had taken place, before any of history had happened, God told King Nebuchadnezzar, after Babylon, there's going to be another kingdom. 
And after that kingdom, there's going to be another kingdom. And after that kingdom, there's going to be another kingdom. And after that kingdom, they will all break up. There'll be many kingdoms. Some will be strong. Some will be weak. They won't get along. There will not be any more one kingdom over the world until the rock of ages comes along and puts all of that to rest. And God's kingdom will last forever. That's the meaning of the dream right there. It's what the Bible says. And that is why I primed you. Because it's easy after we've read this to go back and try to make history fit. That's why we looked at history first. Because look what happened. The Babylonian Empire, 671 to 538 B.C. And after that, another empire came along. They call it the Medo-Persian Empire. And then after that, the Greeks came along. Alexander the Great, one of the swiftest generals the world has ever seen, took over everything quickly. And the Greeks ruled for a while. You know what the Greeks were like? They had all the gods and Zeus and Thor and all those guys. I sometimes mix uh, Roman mythology up with Greek mythology because after the Greeks, along came the Roman Empire. And they liked the mythology of, Greeks, of Greece so much, they adopted it and changed the names to their own names. That's why I mix it up. But it was the Roman Empire that was in charge when Jesus came along. That's why the man said, who should we give tribute to? And Jesus said, who is on this coin? Caesar's on the coin. Caesar is a Roman ruler. Rome, Pilate of Rome. And it wasn't by accident. The Bible says in Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. But after the Roman Empire, all of those kingdoms over there broke up just like we have now. There's no Roman Empire over everything. What do we have? We got Italy and France and England and Belgium and Holland, Portugal, Prussia, Austria, Spain, Greece. We got all these kingdoms. Some are strong, some are weak, and we don't get along. I just came from South Asia was blessed to have this opportunity, preaching this sermon right here. And they had a very interesting view, being able to look at the history from the outside. Also, while under the oppression of a pseudo-dictator, we laid this stuff out there like, blessed be the name of the Lord. Surely his truth shall last forever. Because history has unfolded just like the Lord told it. Okay, that's not really a word, but I, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> we are divided. And the Bible says, they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And throughout history, there have been persons who have tried to unite everything into one empire. And some came pretty close. But they failed because the Word of God said, after the, after the countries are broken up into strong and weak countries, the next empire to rule the world will be God's empire. So what happened? Here's an unpleasant fellow, Adolf Hitler. You may have heard of him. Tried very hard to unite the world. It is almost amazing to look at the bad choices that Hitler made at the end. He could have had the world just start doing crazy stuff. No one understands. I understand. <laughs> Word of God said, you're not going to do it. This brother right here, Napoleon, wasn't really all that short. They say he was short, but he wasn't. Came close, failed, because the Word of God said no. The next person to rule the whole world is going to be me. That's what God says. 
And a person who doesn't really get the credit that is owed to him, this guy right here. Anybody tell me who that is? Genghis Khan. Here's an idea of how successful Genghis Khan was in almost conquering the world. Let's see if I get this right. 80% of us in this room got Genghis Khan DNA. And he was just leaving genetic material everywhere he went. And he went everywhere. Almost succeeded, but the story goes that he was just about to succeed and somebody back home died. Genghis said, stop. We all are going to go back to Asia. And they all went back, had the funeral, and then they came back and tried to cut. too late by then. Why would he do such a thing? Word of God. God said, no one will rule the entire world after that point until I come in my kingdom. Until I come in my kingdom. And with all that history, we cannot forget that the dream and the prophecy does not end with the countries that don't mix together. That's not the end of it. The end of the prophecy <laughs> is that a stone is cut out of the mountainside. No human hands have anything to do with the formation of this kingdom. No, no, no. There is no mortal that took a chisel and a pick and built the foundation of this kingdom. No. And this stone comes out of the mountainside, flies all the way down through space to a history, to a planet that has been troubled and beleaguered for thousands of years, to people who are crying out for deliverance, hungry people, hurting people, oppressed people, and the rock hits it, and all of the glory of man turns to Dust. The prophecy ends with Jesus coming back. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, by the way, that here in the Old Testament it is prophesied that Jesus would come back thousands of years before Jesus stood there before the temple and said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. the truth in the Word of God, the power in the Word of God, that God could say it beforehand with confidence and history follow the Word of the Lord. You know what that means? If the Word of God be true, when it said Hitler Napoleon, Genghis Khan, and many others would fail. If the word of God was true, when it said that Babylon, who was at its height, Babylon had no enemies, not really. The word of God was able to confidently say, you're still going to have another kingdom follow you. You will not last forever. And if the word was true there, if we can look through the books of history going backward and we can see the thumbprint, the handiwork of God in our history, then, then, when it says something crazy like, Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. When it says something crazy like the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When the Bible says something crazy like believe only and you will be saved, I will be saved. 
messed up me, messed up you. When the Bible says that we can make it, then we can believe every word. And when Jesus says he came to save those that were lost, we can believe it. When it says to those who overcome, we can believe it. When it says the race doesn't have to be won by the strongest, because that's not me, or the fastest, and surely me. But if you can just make it to the end, we can believe it. That's the power in the word. That's the truth in the word right there. That if we can believe that God is right in all of that, and we can believe that God is right when he says he can save us. You never end a message without giving somebody an opportunity to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Jesus said the word is truth. And if the word is truth, then we ought to do everything it says. Everything, everything, everything. And that's what I want to do. Because I want to be saved. I want my family to be saved. Me, my beautiful wife, my two bad kids, I want them saved. So we will do what the Word says do. Anybody else in here want to do what the Word says do? Every little commitment that we make, it makes a difference in heaven. Yeah, it does. If you want to be saved and you want to follow the Word to the letter, I invite you to stand with me. If you want to, if you don't want to, go ahead and stay seated. But if you do, I invite you to stand. And every little commitment we make is recorded in heaven. And every time we exercise our faith in the Jesus that died for us, in the Jesus that bled for us, in the Jesus that can save us, we get just that closer to the kingdom. And that's all right with me. Yeah, it is. I think we should pray. Oh, our Father in heaven, we praise you that we do not serve and worship a powerless God. We praise you that we do not follow an empty word. We praise you that there is power in the word, as there's power in the God. And Lord, we want to do thy will, but we can't do it on our own. We've tried and tried and we mess up. Try some more, mess up some more. But you said all we got to do is reach out to you. And that through you all things are possible. And so we have stood to our feet, putting our faith into physical motion and thereby reaching out to you, Jesus. Asking you to change us. Asking you to bless us. Asking you to save us. It's all we want, Lord, not riches and fame, all that stuff is nice, but we want to be saved, whatever the cost, whatever the cost, save us, Lord. And when it is all said and done, and the timeline that has been laid out there in the book of Daniel has gone to its completion, and the rock that is thy kingdom has filled the earth, let us be together like this at the welcome table mm. on the sea of glass father let no one be absent around your throne 
This is what we ask in the mighty name, the name that is Jesus Christ. Let everybody in the building say, Amen. 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 Oh, you may be seated. Now listen, every night when we finish, we, the preachers, and some of the elders, we meet down here. We love to pray with you. Oh, we are brothers and sisters and family needs to pray together. So if you have a special prayer request or you just want to pray, come on down and we would love to pray with you. Also, if you have any questions, any texts or scriptures that you'd like to have pointed out, we will be down here to talk, love to study the Word of God with you. We're going to tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, Pastor Thomas takes up the torch and he will be bringing good news directly from the Word of God. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm Pastor Ryan. God bless you.